Hello. There are two cases that one can make for formative assessment. One is a kind of intuitive case. Over 50 years ago now, one of America's leading educational psychologists, David Azubel, said, if I had to reduce all of educational psychology to just one principle, I would say this, the most important factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain this and teach accordingly. So the idea is that we should actually find out where students are. Unfortunately, of course, while that principle about learning is very important, there's a rather uncomfortable fact about the world, which is that our children do not learn what we teach. We teach these wonderful lessons, we take in their notebooks, we look at what they wrote, and we wonder why they didn't learn what we taught them. So you can think of formative assessment as arising from the fact that good teaching starts from where the learner is, and students don't always learn what we teach, so we'd better find out what they did learn before we teach them something else. The empirical case comes from looking at research from all over the world. And now we have very good guides to research on formative assessment in every country where this has been studied, at every age of student, in every school subject where researchers have looked at this, when teachers pay attention to these kinds of classroom processes, students learn more. So there's no doubt that the research evidence and the logic of formative assessment make a compelling case for making formative assessment a priority for every school. Unfortunately, that's a very broad field. Different people define formative assessment in different ways, and so it's often helpful to clarify what we're talking about. So for me, there are at least three different timescales over which formative assessment can take place. The long cycle, typically four weeks to a year, is when we actually look at students' progress over a period of time, and we use that kind of assessment to adjust our curriculum and to monitor student progress. We can also use assessment on a shorter time scale, what Richard Stiggins calls student-involved classroom assessment. So we make sure that students know what they're meant to be doing, we know that they understand what they need to do to get a good grade, and that's a valuable process too. But the biggest impact comes when we do formative assessment minute by minute and day by day, because then we get engagement and responsiveness. Now, of course, the best teachers have always done this. The best teachers have always relied on the cues they're getting from their students to adjust their instruction to better meet the students' learning needs. But very often, teachers rely on rather poor quality evidence for those instructional decisions. So typically, a teacher might ask a class a question to help her decide whether the class is ready to move on or not. And often that question is answered by just one or two students. What that means is the teacher's evidence for her instructional decisions is rather poor quality. She doesn't know what's happening in the heads of the other students in that class. So when we embrace the idea of classroom assessment as happening minute by minute and day by day, we focus on the adequacy of the evidence that we have. If you're only hearing from the confident, articulate students, the quality of your evidence is not very good. And so the idea is we create classrooms where we engage more students, we get evidence from more of them, and we can use that to respond to their learning needs. Now to get into a bit more detail, I think it's helpful to think of formative assessment as resulting from crossing three processes in education with three kinds of people in classrooms. So the three processes are where the learner is right now, where they're going and how to get there. And the three kinds of people in classrooms are teachers, the learners themselves, and their peers. And if we cross those three kinds of people with the three processes, we get nine cells. And we could discuss each of the nine cells separately, but I think it makes sense to group some of them together. So the first grouping we call clarifying, sharing, and understanding learning intentions and criteria for success. The idea is that students understand where they're going. The second is that we make sure we find out where the students are. And we call this eliciting evidence. And the reason we use the term eliciting is because it's not just questioning. It's not just asking students questions. Teachers can find out where students are by making statements and expecting students to respond. But teachers can also find out where students are by just observing their performance in a physical task, for example, in physical education, or in art, or just their emerging writing as they're working on a piece of 
creative fiction. The third strategy we call providing feedback that moves learners forward. And the reason we phrase it in that way is because back in 1998, Paul Black and I wrote a booklet called Inside the Black Box, where we encouraged teachers to give feedback in the form of comments rather than scores or grades. And to their credit, many teachers follow that advice. But unfortunately, a lot of the comments were not that helpful. They were not actually helping children move forward. They were telling students what was wrong with the previous piece of work. And I think the crucial principle here is that the major purpose of feedback is not to improve the student's work, it's to improve the student. So the idea is that good feedback helps students do a better piece of work next time they do something similar because of the feedback they received. The last two strategies underscore the fact that, as Richard Stiggins says, the most important educational decisions that are taken in classrooms are not taken by teachers, they're taken by students. It doesn't matter how good your feedback is, if your students have no desire to learn, then you're wasting your time. So we have to activate students as learning resources for one another, and we also have to activate students as owners of their own learning. And in many ways, this last strategy, activating students as owners of their own learning, is the most important. Because once teachers help students become, in the psychological jargon, self-regulating learners, they can take their own learning forward when there's nobody else around. So the idea of all of the strategies is they lead towards this fifth and final strategy of activating students as owners of their own learning because then the students can actually manage and become independent learners. They can actually figure out what they're learning when they're not learning, what they need to do about it if they're not learning, and when they need to ask for help, when they know that they should be struggling through this healthfully themselves because that's, that struggle can be productive. So in this topic, we're going to spend part one going through each of these strategies in more detail. You will discover how to actually share learning intentions and success criteria with students, to elicit evidence from them, to give feedback that moves learning forward, to capitalise on the power of students helping each other learn, and finally, of course, then to help students become more active as owners of their own learning. And then in part two, we'll dip into each of these five strategies in a bit more depth as you develop your practice. Okay.